Uh, I'm Tom Webster from Sounds Profitable, and uh, we're going to debut the first look at a brand new research study that we have produced called the Ad Barkin, and I'm going to explain what that means in just a moment. And then this distinguished, highly distinguished panel, uh, we're going to chat about the results uh, a little bit. So I'm going to introduce the panel very quickly. I'm going to go into the research. If I could have my slide up, please. Uh, this is Julia Kelly from Wondery, Gabe Tartaglia from uh, SXM, and Mattia Verzella from Spreaker. And uh, they are going to talk a little bit about the research and, uh, that we've gone through in this study, which is called the Ad Bargain. And there it is. Could I have uh, the actual, that's the presenter view, I believe. Um, so the Ad Bargain was named because that's what we do when we consume advertising supported media. We make a deal. We say, I will pay attention to these ads, we hope, in exchange for free content that I like. And we make that as consumers every time we consume ad supported, me uh, every time that we consume ad supported media, right? So the ad bargain really refers to that exchange of value that happens between the consumer and the content provider. And we think that the ad bargain in podcasting is exceptional. Uh, but we wanted to find out just how good or bad it was. And so we fielded some research to that extent. And that is called the ad bargain, attracting consumer attention in a sea of ads. Uh, the full report is going to be released in a couple of weeks. There'll be a QR code here at the end so that you can sign up and get it for free. Um, and there's a whole lot of research in there. There's some brand specific things that I'm not going to get to today. But part of the impetus for this study was a study that we did last year called the Podcast Landscape. And we asked people their perceptions of podcasting in general, of, of the medium of podcasting as a career. We asked that to a large sample of the general population, and they were extraordinarily positive about podcasting and podcasters, even if they weren't actually listening to the medium. They had a very high, um, uh, high opinion of podcasting as a, as a medium, as a career, as an art form. And so we wanted to see if there was sort of a halo effect, right? Is, there, uh, is it a positive association with a brand if they're involved or supporting a podcast that people like? So we fielded this study, which was a large study of over 2,000 uh, Americans, 18 plus, weighted to the census. And we asked questions about all platforms. This was not a podcasting study per se. We asked about podcasting. We asked about YouTube. We asked about TikTok. We asked about all kinds of different things. Um, and the first thing, of course, we asked is, have you used this medium in the past seven days? And we know that over 100 million people in this country have listened to a podcast. Weekly consumers in study after study over the past year or so have been about a third of Americans say that they listen to a podcast every single week. And I'm sure many of you in this room do as well. I listen to them every day because I'm contractually obligated to by nature of my profession. But podcasting sits now at about three in 10 weekly users and continues to grow. It is not, uh, it's really not declined since uh, I started being involved with tracking the medium back in 2006 when I was with Edison Research in their infinite dial study, which is, I believe, coming out again in a couple of weeks. So the medium has been continuing to grow, but it also is first in the hearts of consumers when it comes to advertising. And this is really one that I wanted to lead off with, with all of the, the various forms of media in here. I'm more willing to consider products and services after I learn about them on this media. And podcasting came out uh, in th at the top here, and I think Mike showed you some examples of why that is, of why podcast advertising is particularly appealing and compelling. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about really quickly today before we get to our panel is I wanted to make a direct comparison just to uh, focus our thoughts a little bit between podcasting, uh, YouTube and CTV are d all drawing a lot of advertising dollars. And they're all sort of in the same game, right? They're all in the play a spot to get your attention game. So how are these three different media channels, which uh, again are all growing in revenue and, and growing an audience, uh, how do they hold up their end of the ad bargain? So certainly seeing or, or hearing an advertisement on podcasting 37% say it makes them more likely to purchase. That led uh, both YouTube and uh, CTV here, right? Sponsorship messages on the following provide compelling discounts or offers. People recall that, right? The, the promo codes are certainly a very important part of the direct response side of podcasting, but your favorite podcasts came up at the top here. And I'm showing you all of these, by the way. I did not leave a question out of this series. You have discovered new brands or products from sponsorship messages on the following. Again, podcasts come up on the top here at 69% who say that they have done that. 
The ads you see or hear on the following help creators to continue making new content. Now there's a very strong association here, certainly with podcasts at 80, also with your favorite YouTube channels at 78%, right? Very strong association here that the ads help support the creators, very clear tie. Your opinion of a brand is more positive when you find out it supports your favorite podcast, again, at the top here, at 69%, right? So there's an incredible positive regard for the podcast that gets transferred to the brand that actively supports that content. And you will go out of your way to support a brand that supports your favorite podcast. More than half agreed with that. And I want to point out here, I know this is a stream of numbers, but this is more than half saying that advertising works on them, which is not a small thing to say. Right? It's not a small statement. It is a positive statement about advertising, which you often have to pry out of people by twisting their arms, sometimes very violently, as we heard in our first true crime panel. Sponsorship messages on the following are less annoying than other ads, than in other platforms. Again, favorite podcast does very well here, 63% compared to 54 for YouTube and 52 for your favorite streaming TV shows. How likely are you to recommend a product or show that you see or hear advertised on each of these media platforms? Again, podcasting comes up in, at the four here at 59%, right? Say that they're likely, either very or somewhat likely, to recommend a product or show that they hear advertised on podcasts. 65% say that they're likely to look for more information about a product or service. Again, podcasting is coming up at the top of every single one of these questions that we asked. How likely are you to purchase a product or service you see advertised? 53%. Again, more than half say that advertising works on them when they hear it in a podcast, right? Which again, is no small statement to make. We also asked a question about privacy. Would you agree or disagree that the following protects your privacy? Podcasting came up uh, on the top here at 68%. Certainly it is a concern of American consumers and. Uh, and a concern of consumers worldwide. So we know that there is a lot of positive regard for podcasting and podcasters, but what we now can show in the ad bargain is that this positive regard transfers to brands, it transfers to advertising. And all of these questions, this steady stream of questions where podcasting came out on top of YouTube and, uh, and streaming television are positive statements about ads because the ads are part of the flavor of the show, again, as you heard with Mike, right? So that positive regard, that halo effect, transfers to products, transfers to services. It makes people believe that those brands and products support the content. Therefore, they can't be bad people. And that's really what true sponsorship and what advertising and podcast does, is it reinforces that connection about the people behind a brand, that if they're supporting this great show that you like, whatever content, whatever genre, then they can't be bad people. And they probably make good stuff, and that's transferring to the product and to the ads and to the halo effect overall that advertising and podcasts have. So that's a quick look at the study. The QR code there will get you to register, uh, register for the, uh, the debut of the full study, which again is gonna have a lot more data in it. and. Uh, I think we'll probably spend a good half hour or so on that, so I hope you do sign up for it. But I want to turn now to the panel, and I would like to sit, so I'm going to do that. Uh, and I'll just start really with some just kind of general observations about the quick look at the study that you all had. I know I, I sent some top line results. Uh, and Julie, I'll start with you, just initial impressions of, of what you saw and any surprises or delights? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, just holistically, I think what has been really exciting for me working in this industry for the past six years is, um, you know, from my previous background in digital, people are really, really interested in learning more about what podcasts can do. Anecdotally, you walk into a room and people are automatically giving you their favorite podcast, saying how much they love it, saying how much they bought an article couch because they heard, you know, um, an impassioned read from a host um, from their favorite podcast about it. But I think for a long time, and it's no secret, um, a lot of the, the research and data has not um, been super available to back that up. And so the marrying of that authentic uh, passion for the media just anecdotally and in their personal lives and then also being able to provide this, you know, in, insanely amazing insights on what the medium can do for their brands and their advertisers has been really, really um, instrumental in moving uh, those conversations along for our teams. Super. Gabe, what did you think when you saw it? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I was not surprised. Um, in this day of paywalls going up everywhere, um, I think listeners, uh, viewers generally understand that if I'm getting content for free, there's going to be ads that come along with it. I think that's the basis. Um, but specific to podcast, because the host in most cases, that's kind of the thing. Like that's what you're tuning in for. Um, even if it's a great story, the host is the storyteller. And being able to connect with that host um, make them kind of part of your inner friend circle, family circle. That's that's the level listeners have. So when that ad is running on that host show, when that host is doing a host read, the stats here bear it out. I mean, you could absolutely see the credibility that ha that host brings to the brand, and ob which obviously helps the business. Uh, and I know, Mattia, when you emailed me after the study and with kind of some observations about it, I think you had... Uh kind of a take on why all of this works so well. Yeah, and I think, well, first of all, I think we should all take a victory lap because all these studies, researches are just, I don't know, I feel that podcasting is like gold. Holds the value and you can resell it for more. Um, and over the years we've seen, you know, all the, all the numbers are going up, are growing and, and increasing. So it's a great, it's a great research that also points out uh, the, the light on the advertising section. Um, the why is very interesting though. You know, you see that podcasting is obviously a one sensory channel uh, compared to YouTube, Instagram, or TikTok. They're, you know, they have two sensory, they have video and audio, but we're still, we're scoring high as they do. Um, and that to me is very interesting because then I ask myself, why is that? And the reason I, I'm, I'm provoking uh, in, in a bit, but like I think that the relationship, that you mentioned that the relationship with the audience by the podcaster and the host, it's very important. And that creates that level of trust and credibility on the, on the ads as well. And also on the audience side, there's a very intentional consumption. Uh, you don't turn the TV and you go around the house. I mean, you turn on the podcast and the podcast stays in your ears when you go around the house. So it's very with you, it's very intentional, very um, very immediate. And you can tell on the advertising side as well. Let's talk a little bit about the audience. Uh, certainly this study, the ad bargain, which we fielded with Signal Hill Insights. I know there's a, a couple of uh, people from Signal Hill uh, in the audience. And also the data that Edison Research puts out. Both show that the weekly audience for podcasting is about a third of the country, in, in, in America certainly. So a two-part question. First, what's wrong with the other two-thirds? What's wrong with the people? Uh, but second, you know, what are some growth strategies that we should be looking towards? How do we make, how do we get this medium to grow even further? And, and you know, even what's what's worked better, what's worked worse? So, uh, anybody else want to jump in on that? Yeah. So, first of all, there's nothing wrong with 31 percent. That's over 100 million Americans. Uh, so that's strong. That's that scale that you could bring to advertisers today without growing any further. But if you do want to answer the question, how do you continue to grow and evolve? Um, in my opinion, we need to stop thinking about podcast as an audio product. Audio is a kernel of content that can be used in many ways. You've heard about already on the stage today on video, social, etc. These are just different ways to repurpose that same content, and by the way, it's most likely also reaching a net new listener. Because if you listen to a download of the podcast, you're probably also not going to watch it on YouTube. But that new YouTube listener then finds and discovers that podcast, or a social media post, they discover that podcast, then cycles them back into the audio listening. I think the more consumers and um, sorry, creators and publishers think about uh, a multi-channel approach to it and not just an audio uh, approach is going to continue to help us grow. Yeah, and going off of that, I think one thing that we always try to frame our product and our offering as is we're audio first, but we're not audio only. So we're finding a lot more, to Gabe's point, discoverability on you know YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and it's bringing younger, more diverse consumers back to the podcast itself. Yeah, we did a, a study um, in the last quarter called Sound You Can See. It was a study that preceded this one. And... One of the interesting things that we, uh, that we learned from that was that people have a very distinct idea of what a podcast on YouTube is compared to uh, a YouTube video, right? And, like they know it's a podcast. It's generally people talking into microphones in a studio. It's generally, you know, conversational or a monologue or, you know, an interview. It's more about the, uh, 
the the style of show than it is the the genre or content, and all of it is a subset of the show, right? The podcast is a part of the show, um, so that's definitely something that I think has helped the medium grow. But Mattia, anything you wanted to add on that? I think, like every relationship, you know, my my online therapist says, you know, I start with communication. You know, respect and trust, right? Every relationship needs to to have that element, and I think that um, I want to veer a little bit away from from what you guys are saying, but just like putting the attention on the technology that can enable all that trust and respect and communication. Um, one other thing that happened a few weeks ago, I think um, uh, Brian actually pointed out uh, on the Sound Profitable uh, channel, I think it was Lore, it was complaining about, uh, you know, a misassignment uh, of IAB categories uh, to the ads that were coming to his shows. And that kind of broke that trust, credibility, uh, relationship that the audience and, and the host had because they were blocked categories. So you shouldn't get politics if you don't want political, political ads. And so I think we need to, you know, as Spreaker, for example, we worked uh, on a system to actually prevent that from happening. Uh, we transcribe all the ads. We make sure that the IAB category is, is connected to what the actual ad says. And if it's wrong or if it's missing or if it's miscategorized, we recategorize automatically or manually. And I think that that speaks to growing uh, an ecosystem that is trustworthy and can go above the 31% that is great, but I wish we were a 66% at this time. So how do we leverage the positivity that we see in this study and in others that, that uh, we have put out and, and other companies have put out? People are very positive about podcasts. They're very positive about the creators behind them. They're positive about podcasting, even though you know, only murders in the building tried to paint us all as dorks. Uh, people seem to really like podcasting and podcasters and hold it in high regard. How are some of the ways that we can leverage that positivity for the benefit of the medium, but also for the benefit of brands? I'll start. Um, well, I, I think we're doing this, right? We, are, we need to make it easier to monetize podcasts. I mean, it's, you know, for the sake of the creator, they're, they're thinking about the content, but the content, if it's done right, will drive revenue. And that then does benefit the brands, it benefits the creator, and then keeps the entire kind of cycle of life going. Um, we've had, from a mom and pop industry, we've grown up very, very quickly, and we've encountered along the way various friction points. Some of them were planned or understood, some of them were surprises. And as the industry starts to get better at, you know, what's the definition of a download and how does that turn into an impression and brand safety and all the hundreds of other, you know, aspects, it's going to invite especially more traditional brand advertisers, not as many of the DTC legacy accounts that have been with us for a long time, but those brand advertisers that have big budgets. Bring them to the party, and I think you're seeing that over the past couple years, um, which is why um, podcast advertising has been the tip of the spear in terms of growth in the audio category, and quite frankly, outside of a few social players, it's really the fastest growing sector in all of media. Um, so the things we're doing to eliminate friction, to make it easier and more transparent to buy, begets you more advertisers, revenue, and helps the entire ecosystem. And I just want to add one point on this. I think um, scaling, getting more uh, content creators um, revenue, because at the end of the day, we see this virtual cycle of, you know, um, you're an independent creator. Uh, you get a little bit of money from programmatic advertising, which has no barriers of entry. And that creates the opportunity to buy a new microphone, new equipment, new things, and then your quality improves. And that gets you to a point where you get a better audience and more audience. So I think it's it's a virtual cycle that you know barrier of entry needs to be the the last thing that we think about because it has to be easy to get in, make money, and improve the quality and the audience. Yeah, and I think as we expand more into brand advertisers, really making sure that we're prioritizing things like measurement, things like brands, bifurcating what brand safety and brand suitability means, right? Because those are two very different things. Um, but just really making sure that we're listening to voice of customer and sort of continuing to evolve to make sure that we're showing up for advertisers no matter where they're coming to us from. Uh, just on the topic of measurement, since it, uh, a couple of you brought it up, um, 
what is the state of measurement in podcasting right now? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it fantastic? What are, what are the questions that you're getting? Well, it's fragmented, right? There is no industry standard. Um, there's probably some, you know, leaders in the industry that could push harder to get some more standardization. I think um, based on what Apple did with iOS 17, it sort of forced us into a, you know, probably a cleaner but more painful, um, you know, period to go through. And uh, I don't think that's done. I think we're going to continue to have to refine that. Marketers expect that if you're paying for an impression, that that impression runs to the intended audience in as efficient a way as possible. And they want to be able to track that on the back end. As I said before, podcasting has come so far in the last couple of years to how, to be competing with this. But realistically, we're probably in the top of the third inning on this. I mean, there's if you would think about, you know, even connected TV, which is also relatively nascent, the type of capabilities that they have to bring back an attribution, we're getting that with some third-party vendors, but to be able to have it standardized and more holistic approach across the industry will benefit us all. Yeah, I always love getting those questions uh, when I'm uh, presenting for uh, agencies and brands, and I ask them like if they've bought radio or TV before, and because uh, let me tell you how those are measured. <laughs> I used to work. Uh, I, I started my career in the radio business, and it's uh, our measurement's really good. I'll just, I'll just say. I, I, I also, maybe a few years ago, also started my career in radio. And I, I really think uh, linear uh, media, TV, radio, I think they get the hall pass for having just done it that way for decades. It's just the, you know, it's just been around forever. It hasn't changed much. So um, agencies, brands accept that for what it is. But you're right. Compared to the certain, cert, the state of play of anything digital, including podcast, um, we are so much more superior at it, but we're held to a higher bar because we're the new kid on the block. So uh, one of the things that this data really showed, I think, is the the positive regard that people hold the medium in and also that transference of that positive regard to advertisers. Uh, what do you think, and this is maybe a, a bit of a, uh, I don't know, a, a mythological question perhaps. Um, what do you think sets podcasting apart from these other media that we studied when it comes to that positive regard, when it comes to that uh, transference of, of that positivity to the advertisers? What does podcasting do do right or do better to enable that? I think it's all about authenticity on both sides, right? So, you know, when a listener is has built a level of trust with the host, um, they really think of that as as a as a friend recommending products and services to them. So it's kind of like, you know, your real your friend recommending a restaurant to you. You're gonna take that probably with a little bit more gravitas than, uh, you know, reading a sponsored post on a foodie blog, right? Um, so it's just really continuing to foster that um, between the host and the listener and continuing to build that authenticity. Um, you know, pulling it, even when you get to the nitty gritty of like crafting copy, right? We want to get copy points and not scripted exactly what we need to be saying for the host read. We want to give them that latitude to continue to foster that trust um, and innovate with, um, you know, with their listeners. I, I would just add, um, it isn't, obviously the host themselves has that built-in credibility, um, one of the things I mentioned earlier, but having the right ad, to Julia, to your point, in that environment, it isn't just the sound of the ad, but is that advertiser actually relevant to the listener? Otherwise, it sounds very jarring and it sounds forced, but if you can get the right advertiser who's contextually relevant so that that listener doesn't hear that ad as a chore, but is like, oh, that might be a product or service that I'm interested in, that does not only help that brand, but it also like helps the podcast because the listener is satisfied with the experience. Yeah, and I'll just tack on to that, that we, uh, we put out a study in uh, 2022 called After These Messages. And we looked at the creative execution of the same ad three different ways. And in the, in the survey itself, we actually put it into a piece of content. We used a, a segment of Jordan Harbinger's interview with Matthew McConaughey, because that was a fairly, that's a fairly mass appeal segment, right? If you get that in a, in a survey or a study, you're probably gonna listen to it. And we put three different executions of an ad in there for Athletic Greens. One that was uh, sort of ad-libbed by Jordan, one that was scripted and read by Jordan, and one that was read by an announcer, but one, but an announcer very in keeping with the tone of the show. Um, and the two big uh, findings from that were, number one, the host read ad did the best, 
But number two, the announcer read ad didn't do that bad. It did just uh, a, a hair worse, really, than, than, the, than the host read ad. And I think that's important, right? Because the host, we, they can't all be host read ads, right? So something, you know, something needs to scale there. So the fact that that did as well as it did, I think, uh, was extremely encouraging. But it has to, as you say, sort of fit with the show. And I just one quick thing: when I was uh, a long time ago in my uh, in my radio career, uh, I did a horrible thing to this to this nation. I I worked on the smooth jazz format, <laughs> and uh, I'm not proud of it. But I did a lot of work in smooth jazz, and I, I remember rolling into a a, a a station in a city with my boss at the time. I was I was in my 20s, and uh, as we're walking into the station, the the you know, the smooth jazz station's playing inside, and it was just this screaming ad for Mitsubishi cars, or try, it was like, you need a car, damn it! You know, one of those ads. And, uh, and, and my boss, uh, Frank Cody, just went, was apoplectic about it. He's like, you spend all of this money to hire us to come in, make your station sound smooth, relaxing, and then you play this? It's like, we work very hard on 45 minutes an hour, of this station, too hard for you to, you know, botch it up with the, with the other 15 minutes. And I think that's that's a key message for anybody in podcasting as well: is that it, you know, keep the tone, make it match. It's part of it's all part of the magic, and the secret sauce. Um, one of the uh, eye-opening stats from the ad bargain, I think, was 37% uh, said that a podcast ad would drive them to purchase. Would actually drive them to purchase. So what are some of the best practices in a podcast ad? What makes a great podcast ad? What, what do you think contributes to that number, which again was the highest number that we saw? 40% of our listeners on the Spreaker platforms, Spreaker content, listen to true crime and comedy. I think when you hear a, an ad that is funny, entertaining, intriguing, I think makes it makes it very, very enticing to, to buy that product. We already have the listener's attention, right? So it's really important that we're capitalizing that and not, you know, not to belabor the, the don't script hosts, give them organic opportunities, but for recorded spots, we don't have to overthink it, right? It doesn't have to be overly produced or overly, you know, overly creative. Like we don't want that Toyota-thon in smooth jazz, you know, crazy uh, experience. So really it's just, you know, outlining what the product or services um, benefits are to the listener. And, you know, it's as simple as that, honestly. I would just add, Julia, something you said earlier about having verbatim ads versus, you know, strict copy points. It just makes it more authentic. And then this is really a no-brainer, but of course, if you could have some sort of a unique offer um, that is not just like, you know, product code X, but something that's truly unique, um, it, it really allows the advertiser to understand, okay, that host or that show brought that uh, new customer to me. And in this age of multi-touch attribution black boxes, and you can never really tell because someone's seen an ad message across 12 different platforms and publishers, did the podcast move the needle? Well, if you could have a specific offer the and you got a call and that offer, the podcast has moved the needle. And because DTC has, has used that, that method for so long, our listeners are very used to it, right? So no matter where you're coming at us, are you in the DTC space? Are you in the more upper funnel branding space? Offering that unique you know, promo code or unique URL or discount, they're already very trained to do that. So it's a natural sort of progression. In my, uh, in my last role at Edison Research, I did a lot of brand lift studies uh, in, in podcasting. And one of, the, uh, one of the clients that we worked with was uh, a, a popular casual dining chicken parts kind of place where people would go to watch the game. I'll just leave it at that. Um, chicken parts doesn't sound too appetizing, but, you know, roll, roll with me from a part of the country. Um, and what they did in the ad, which I thought was very smart uh, to, to kind of solve that attribution a little bit, was you know, they have some very clear messages about you know, what the food they serve is and the coldness of the beer and how it's the place to watch the game. But in the podcast campaign, they used a different message, and it was for a, their 30-minute lunch, which this is not what this place is known for, really. Um, and because it was so distinct and different from anything else that they had advertised, uh, it 
you know, it printed very loudly in the brand lift study, and it showed very clearly that it did, in fact, work, because it, 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 there wasn't that sort of mixing with all the other messages. So, you know, when you can put a distinct message like that in a campaign that makes it special to the podcast, uh, it's really easy in brand lift work to, to show that it was attributable to the podcast, right? So, um, the other thing that came out, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've talked a, a little bit about the authenticity aspect of this, and that's a, f that's a fine line, right? If, you know, if the, the, we assume, and I think most Americans believe that the hosts use the products and services that they advertise, right? That, that's cer certainly something that's come out in, uh, in study after study. Uh, how do we maintain that authenticity? As more and more, uh, advertising dollars come into the space, you know, what are some of the keys to, to maintaining that authenticity that we've talked about, uh, which is a key to the effectiveness, I think? So I'm going to take this question down maybe a, a dark road here. Um, the, there's a paradox happening right now in our business where brand advertisers, especially more than DTC, want to be on those shows that have a loyal audience because the host is authentic. But in many cases, those, you know, the show itself might not be completely brand safe or maybe brand suitable. And then that brand avoids the show. And it just creates this like disconnect where, well, if you want to be where that, you know, that host who clearly has an audience, and they, by the way, those, that, those listeners are hand raisers. They know what they're getting. If there's profanity, if there's whatever adult con topics, what have you. Um, that, that listener knows that what they're getting, they're fine with it because they raised their hand for it and they're just as ready to buy a Mitsubishi or whatever is or Buffalo Wild Wings is the next person. Um, so finding that balance as a, as a brand to say, look, I understand I may need to relax my ad guidelines that wouldn't necessarily be my first choice if it was just me on my own. But if I actually wanna be in an authentic place and reach people where they wanna be and are engaging, I need to relax that a little bit and be okay kind of with whatever that content is because that's what the listener is coming for in the first place. Other thoughts on that? That was like a mic drop. I loved it. <laughs> I a cosign, cosign. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the podcast. Um, we uh, we released a study on brand safety and suitability. Uh, it seems like we released a study for everything, but we we actually did called Safe and Sound, uh, and we asked people specifically about some controversial shows, uh, about some controversial topics, and how they felt about the brands that advertised on them. And as you say, Gabe, they were. They're hand raisers. They they they're there for the show, um, and so you know there, there should be there should not be any hesitation in advertising on things like true crime, for instance, unless the murder was done with the product. Then that might be a different case. I don't know. And Tom, if I if I could on, on true crime, so you know you heard from Brittany earlier with um, Audio Chunk and specifically Crime Junkie. When we onboarded that network, we had that problem of advertisers at first blush. It's like, okay, you know, crime. It's gory. I don't want my product around that. And it took a while to evangelize and educate to explain that. Well, you know what? This is more than just a, a sensational story. This is victim advocacy. This is actually trying to maybe help solve an unsolved case. There is actually so value here that your brand has a place in that conversation and you know after a year we saw many many brands who had said no initially who were like it's not just something I'll be in but it's important for me to be in so to exactly to your point and I want to highlight the point that you said because um, especially in the programmatic space for example that is a little bit more generic and it's a little bit more uh, it's not like a host thread. It's not a direct brand that goes to a specific show, but it's very, very important for platform, for the supply side, to explain and educate the content that we publish, that we support, that we distribute, because brands don't know that content. They have to kind of, we all, with agencies, with media buyers, we all have to explain that there's, there's more to just a title. There's more than just a category. Embrace murder is, is what we're asking brands to do. I think we're saying it's less about the contextual alignment and more about the audience that you're reaching, right? It's Correct. no secret that true crime is reaching affluent females with disposable income, and who doesn't want to reach them, right? So International Women's Day, holla. Um, but yeah, anyway, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Well, let's talk to brands for a moment. I know you're out there. Um, what's, what's some advice for brands that uh, maybe have not committed to podcasting, have not, uh, you know, either to increase their spend or to spend in the first place? What's some advice that you would give them uh, to, you know, to execute in the space, to, to see success in the space? How would you, how would you sell the medium? Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, uh, I, I, this might be a, a sort of elementary answer, but I would say to really trust us and let us, um, you know, it's a very consultative and educational process we find, right? We're very, you know, as it relates to the larger media landscape, podcast is pretty new, right? So um, just really, you know, it's it's our team's remit to really help you feel more comfortable in the space. So using data and research that sounds profitable, it's worked so hard on, um, and also our research um, and how we work with brands and what has been most successful from a case study standpoint, from how we're moving it in advancing in the measurement space, again, going to brand safety and suitability with our partnership with folks like Barometer. Um, there's so, so much to eradicate any of your objections um, or any of your trepidation um, as you move more meaningfully into the space, and that's what folks like us are for. So, I would say to a brand who's considering it, test and learn like you do with every other channel that, that's emerging. Um, podcasting and audio for that matter really punches below its weight class in terms of in, engagement versus ad revenue. Just an audio stat, 31% of a media day is spent listening to audio, 9% of ad revenue goes to audio. Um, that means we've got a lot of work to do. And one of the immutable laws of marketing is that ad dollars will follow engagement. It's just we have to be that Sherpa to help get them there. And by testing in some easy ways, some safer ways to get your toe in the water to, and then t track test results. Hey, measured out okay, let's then take the next step. You're not going to get to like an integrated brand partnership or a branded content series from a new advertiser who's never been in the space to there overnight. You're gonna try some small things, you're gonna fail along the way, but as long as that, host, that uh, brand knows that they're in it for the journey, and that there's a payoff at the end because they get to reach listeners where they are, what they're, where they're engaged in exactly the format they want to be in, then the brand wins. Um, I agree with, with all you said, but um, one thing that I want to add, don't take radio and place it in podcast, don't take video, strip the video, <laughs> get the audio in the podcast. That's uh, definitely a quick way to get into the space. It could be a way to generate revenue. It could be a way to use some budget, but that's you know it goes through education, trust in in the in the industry, and making sure that you know the supply, that you really understand where your content goes, where your ad goes, and we're here for that. We're here for to represent that. You can really tell when something is stripped off off a, a TV show, right? I, I had a client that was producing a news podcast, and it was essentially taken from the their television news and you could just tell and it just didn't it just didn't sound right it goes for the ads and for the content so for, for both both ways yeah it's it's the difference between talking to a lot of people and talking to one person which is really the goal of a good podcaster I think uh, just a follow-up to this to this question on uh, when you hear objections from advertisers or you know from brands what are what are the most common that you get and uh, you know how would you respond to them is there a response to them and what are some things that we need to continue working on I guess objection changes every year <laughs> every year we have a new buzzword every year we have a new topic that we need to kind of understand explain educate educate together like uh, really having a conversation um, it really depends on the year and I think get into the space with the transparency and and an ability to kind of like hey we're in it to to make this business profitable and 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 scalable um, that goes a long way uh, Matez, uh point about transparency is the key um, understanding where my ad runs and then proving that it did run I know that sounds so simple and just rudimentary in marketing, but we haven't always had that in podcasting. So that to me is kind of like the table stakes. Um, and if you can provide that with, you know, that for all those reasons, it, it will at least give brands the, you know, a willingness to at least, okay, this could be a safe place for me to get into and then from there learn as you go. We have the technology. <laughs> we can do that. 
Yeah, I would say um, just from the host read POV, right? People want to tap into that organic, passionate read, but then sometimes from a legal POV, um, you know, they're they're not able to really just let them riff and go. So it's kind of partnering with these brands and advertisers to really help coach them through that. You know, put some guardrails in place um, to help them tap into what really makes podcasting so magic. But then also, you know, checking their boxes as well is something that we work through. I want to talk a little bit about uh, discovery and. You know, when we talk about discovery as podcasters, we're generally trying to answer the question, how can I get people to discover my podcast? Um, and that is certainly something that an, any podcaster has to grapple with, and we can, we can talk about maybe some answers for that. But I also want to ask about the discovery of podcasting, period. How can we get more people aware of podcasts and, uh, and what they do? I mean, I, I'm, I'm fond of telling people there's a podcast for everyone. Right? There is absolutely, and there's more than one. There's hundreds of podcasts for everyone. How do we solve the discovery problem of podcasting? What are some things that work and, and what are some things that we could do? I think the more that we're able to be, um, you know, so we're moving more. It, podcast is so nebulous now, right? To your point, it's it's not just, we're not tethered just to the RSS feed anymore, right? So at the more that we're able, and we're already seeing success in this, everyone has, um, you know, more video content, social extensions, live events, um, really bringing people back to that podcast itself after they're able to be on the platform that they're used to and then they're able to say oh wow I had no idea like that happened to me with New Heights I I did not know of them I, and obviously I better be listening to podcasts this is my job right um, but I found them on Instagram and I then I became a listener so it was just that user journey of being able to put podcast content on places outside of where it typically lives and really meeting listeners and consumers where they are yeah, I, I echo in that. It's being able to play in someone else's sandbox uh, to bring new incremental listeners to you. They will then find you in your in your purest form of, especially if it's an you know audio based podcast. Uh, but f looking at it on social media, seeing clips on YouTube, what have you, um, it just invites new people into the party. And if you can do that kind of in an off platform way, it just it's it's the tried and true way to grow audience. I had an idea. Maybe we can have a track at South by Southwest about podcasting. It's not a bad idea. Just yeah, just Brian, write that down, <laughs> wherever Brian is. Um, yeah, I mean, that's part of what we are doing here, is we are trying to shine a light on podcasting by having this full day event. And we thank you and you all for helping us uh, pull this off. But I do think that's part of it. I do think that's part of just kind of stepping up and saying, look, we're attracting an awful lot of earballs. Um, so, you know, maybe it's time to start paying attention, right? Um, I, I want to have some time for questions from the audience, so uh, while you're thinking of some questions, there is a microphone here. It's very short, <laughs> but it's usable. Uh, so if you do have some questions, uh, by all means, <laughs> the elementary school is coming in. Yes, sorry. Um, while, we're, while we're doing that, though, uh, what are some of your favorite podcasts? I love Watch What Crappens. I'm a big Bravo girly. Anyone who wants to talk Bravo after this, come on over. Um, that's my favorite. I listen that's to it every day. I'll give you an OG answer, uh, Hidden Brain with Shankar. Um, I remember that from NPR days. It's still that natural curiosity. It's just for me, that's, that's appointment listening. What happened to Pizza McDonald's? It's one of the funniest podcasts. That's and, great. Um, that, I, that I keep listening. There's tons of episodes comedy, but very well done. Uh, one of the questions that we asked in the ad bargain was about privacy. And, and uh, you know, as, as consumers are getting, I think, more and more aware, certainly in, uh, in many countries, the laws are, uh, are a lot stricter about privacy. Um, and I guess we've been preparing for the post-cookie world for, I don't know, it feels like 10 years now. Uh, but we are still sort of in the cookie world. Uh, but, but we're getting there, I guess. You know, what, is, what does podcasting have to say about privacy and consumer rights and, and things like that that, uh, that is different or better or meaningful? 
I, I will say I think this is the year we're transitioning out of the cookie. Um, we are though still kind of dealing with the patchwork of you know non-uniformity in terms of standards. I mean, there's state level, um, you know, regulations going in, and every you know judiciary cycle it, something comes up. And as a national platform or a national podcast, that makes it hard. Uh, what we are trying to do is you know, obviously in an anonymized way get into more advanced work in predictive audiences to really say, all right, this is the type of content this profile of a consumer likes. Doesn't mean you're for sure gonna like it, but if you're in that profile, you know, we're gonna, in a probabilistic way, um, get that to you. It's getting more and more accurate. Comscore is doing some good work in that um, it, to allow us to still give the right contextual experience to the right ad, to the right listener in the correct uh, podcast without invading privacy. And that's probably, you know, for now at least, the best we can do until there's some sort of a uniform standard federally. Uh, Mattia, you've talked about tech a couple of times. What, uh, what's been sort of the biggest tech accomplishment to you in, the, in podcasting in the past couple of years, and, and what's the, what are some of the bigger challenges remaining? I think the integration, and I mean, I, I, should, I should probably take a shot every time someone says AI, but um, I think the, <laughs> the integration of AI in all things that we do. I mean, all these probabilistic models that Gabe was talking about is, is part of you know AI machine learning. And I think that there's so much more to do. There's so much more to integrate at every level with the respect of the work and the creation and the creativity. But at the same time, we can, you know, we can really use technology to, to take us to a place where we can save privacy and create an audience targeting. Um, I mean, yeah, technology and AI to me is what um, we've been experiencing at Spreaker. Uh, we've been using that as much as we can, and I think that is a that is an area that needs to be uh, embraced. I had an AI model of my voice done, and it was scary good. It was scary good. I mean, I could tell, but my wife couldn't. She thought, no, she could. She could. Did, tell. did you have a smooth jazz music bed? <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's, that's how I'm going to bring the format back. It's just going to be AI Tom with a smooth jazz music bed. So, Oscar from Wondercraft. What's that? You can ask a question, of course. Come on up to them. Oh, there we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Ray. I'm with Spotify, working on the Megaphone platform. So, we're bringing a lot of YouTubers over, no surprise, to, to uh, podcasting for the first time. And it's really interesting because we talk about ad load. And they're like, how many can I put? And then I talk with podcasters, and they're like, can we just do two or three? So I'm wondering, how do we talk about ad load and kind of make sure that we're maximizing the revenue without affecting the audience? Because there seems to be two very different camps in that direction. Yeah, well, first I'll say consider the environment that you're on. You know, if you're on YouTube as an example, by nature, all of us a are trained to get more ads on YouTube than most other, you know, platforms. So to a podcaster, it's like, all right, maybe you only want three or four ad markers on your 45 minute episode. But if that were on YouTube today, whether you're doing it or not, you know, Google's going to sell 12 ads into that. So be okay with that because the listener is already kind of acclimated to it. If I if I can add one more thing, I also think there is a, there is a need for the podcaster and the host to communicate to their audience about the number of uh, the number of ads and the and the way that it makes money to support the podcast. And I think that then we go out of the is too good before is not good as long as there is a um, shared objective from the host and the audience to actually say well. I'm listening to, a, to an ad because I'm supporting that content. I think we can get into a better conversation rather than just like asking for how many is good. Right, setting it up. Curious if there, has there been any studies to see at what point ad load starts to, to make audiences drop off? Uh, we're actually about to field one. Great. So it'll be, it'll be the next thing that Sounds Profitable puts out. Awesome, thank you guys. Hi there. Thank you. This is, um, I'm Farah from BBC Studios. Um, thinking about the in-between space from a branded series to a host-read ad, um, I'm interested in your perspective on a, a mini-cast where you have the pre-roll space, mid-roll, and end to just sort of 
to tell a short form story within an editorial podcast that a brand wants to be associated with, giving them a little bit more space, but not needing to create that heavy new branded series that no one's gonna listen to anyway. Yeah, that's what we always encourage. So we always want to, um, you know, obviously a lot of folks will approach us and say, branded content series, and certainly that has its time and its place, and 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 we're, we're pumped about those opportunities as well. Um, but when we're able to tap into an existing audience, that just makes so much more sense because you're not starting from net new, um, and you're able to build on that trust and that listener. As long as there's that um, contextual alignment, and we're not shocking the audience with something so, so different than what would normally be on the show, um, I think that's really the, the magic sauce for that kind of activation. And how do you find that you move them from the host red ad to that richer engagement? I think they're really, they're mostly excited about it, right? Yeah. Because they want to feel like they're doing something super creative, sort of outside of the box, um, you know, something that can be a little bit more splashy. Um, so we find that that's actually a, a welcome conversation, typically. We, we've we had success, um, it sounds like a, a marketing dream come true, where the advertiser finds us when they ask. <clears throat> like, they know that host, maybe they're a celebrity or something. And, you know, they do that thing, that aligns exactly with my KPIs of what I'm trying to do or my brand identity, could I do this? And by the way, not just a bonus episode where it's logo slappy, but truly integrated in the show itself. Right. And that a lot of times hits the mark for the host and that creates really that perfect partnership. Mm. Thank you. Hi y'all, my name is Charity. I'm the host of Only In Your Dreams podcast. I have a question from the podcast perspective. How, or what is your recommendation for a podcast host to position themselves to get brands, aside from attending the podcast track at South by Southwest? Uh, I'll give you a two part answer. The okay. boring part yes. is scale, of course. You yeah. know, there's, there's just a certain amount of scale that you would need to make it worth doing a media buy. Obviously you can do programmatically or within a network, mm -hmm. but show direct uh, scale. Probably the more exciting thing are is that brands are interested now in investing in to ba basically become incubators. Um, we were in the news last week, SiriusXM launched our, uh, it's called Listen Next, which is a new program um, targeting content curation of diverse voices. And we've lined up brands, even before we knew who those new shows were gonna be, mm -hmm. State Farm's our launch sponsor, um, to be able to, as part of what they're buying, they're basically providing a grant of quite a bit of money for a host to be funded for a year to develop that, con that content in that show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what We then took it one step further and said, State Farm in this case, um, we don't need you to buy ads on the show. We need you to buy marketing for the show elsewhere. And then we will give you all the earned media, the yeah. traffic to the show. You're obviously the launch sponsor of it. That creates that perfect, you know, holy trilogy of, you know, to the content creator, gives them a space and funding to actually build scale if they didn't have it in the first place. Mm -hmm. To the brand, it gives them a way to get involved, you know, for kind of a bootstrapping yeah. operation. And then, you know, for us, it just gives us, you know, good, uh, a good, incubator of content that we otherwise might not have had. I see. Our application's open. Yes. I, okay. I can find you afterwards. Awesome. Yes, yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Max Lebo. Thank you so much for your time. Shameless plug. I produce podcasts. One of them is called The Final War. It's about an a, a American citizen who's hacked by the Chinese government. Anyway, it's a limited series, and so I find myself curious how this data applies to limited series and what the advertiser's perspective is in this realm towards limited series because I didn't see like the distinction there and I know that there's cold feet in that direction as opposed to some other things I produce or that you know it's it just it's you, new episodes weekly and there's if if the audience is growing for a limited series and you can re up on the ad space is there an inclination for advertisers towards that or yeah, um, that limited series is a challenge, but I'll maybe give you the, the hack around that. Um, obviously, most advertisers want to see the scale um, in order to then say, I'm going to invest. And by the time the scale happens, then the show is gone. Mm -hmm. um, but we have, and we've seen this with partners where we've talked to them about, well, you can do these as limited series, but make it an, a regular or anniversary thing. Mm -hmm. So four or five seasons worth, you know, we know every spring that this is going to be a six episode short run. And and if we can show results from last spring, we can sell that for you ahead of time. So that's probably the, the best way to look at it. And, and is there any inclination for advertisers to say, as they see the audience growing, you can like re-up on the ad space, right? And sell it at a premium or 
Yeah. Is it I, once it's it, once all the episodes are produced, they're kind of over. It. Yeah. The I mean, it further complicating. And you know, every case is a little bit different. But if it's a short run series that's spread out, you might be able to do that. If mm -hmm. it's a binge drop short run series, that's very obviously that's in real time, and you you couldn't then set up the next ad deal. Mm -hmm. That is where programmatic and network advertising could be your best friend, though. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. And also using the same RSS feed for multiple series can be a. I mean, I'm not saying, go, but. Like make sure that you're not losing your audience as you build new content, but you build on top of the audience that you had before. So that could be a quick. Yeah, and I would say less, you know, but host continuity a lot of times can really help too, like paired with those two. Right, yeah. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Kevin. Um, just, I have a question more from the brand side that wants to be more involved with podcast buying and being involved in this space. Um, as someone that's very experienced with programmatic advertising and working with all these algorithms, it's become very detached from the human element. And so this is very interesting to me as a way to grab people's attention. But I'm just curious, how do you kind of go about that at a, at a scale level? Like, is it better to just develop some very specific relationships with some podcasters that you feel like are a really good fit? Or should you just try a bunch of different things and see what resonates. And this will have to be a quick answer because we have been yeah. given the hook. <laughs> We've been given the hook. Uh, I would say, uh, um, I'm a fast talker. I'm from New York, so I'm going to do it fast. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, that we always encourage a mix, right? So not only host-specific show alignment, but then also you know, targeted ad solutions. So then you can really test and learn and ramp up quickly on what you feel like is moving the needle for your KPIs. So you know, again, kind of like harnessing the breadth of the offering overall. So, yeah, and also you can buy podcasts programmatically now. That's so, what I was just about to ask. there you go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Let's chat later. <laughs> Julia, Gabe, Matia, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll see you soon. <laughs>